Hi everyone, my name is PK. Here I have an amazing guest, Tin Nguyen. And Tin went from zero properties all the way up to six properties, then all the way down to zero properties again. He's got one investment property now. Very interesting kind of journey. But in this episode, he's not, by the way, a client of the Property Investment Accelerator. But what I'm trying to do is bring on to my platform just real people with real stories that aren't like hidden buyer's agents or hidden mortgage brokers or hidden anything to sell you. He has nothing to sell you. He's just trying to take his experiences, good, bad, and ugly, and share them so that you can avoid mistakes that cost tens of thousands of dollars and also receive like huge nugget balls that will allow you to advance your property investing journey. So like I've, I'm kind of of this idea right now to bring inspiration, ideation, but also realization because sure, inspiration is great. Ideation is great. You, you learn so many tactics and strategies, but also realization, you know, property investing is not all rosy. It's not all just like fun and games. There's things that go wrong. And I think it's great to educate everyone of the things that can go wrong, not just by me, but from people who've actually done them. So I'm really appreciative, Tin, of uh, you making time on this. What is it? Tuesday midday. I don't know if you're, you're meant to be working right now, but it's really good to chat with you. It's my lunch break. Yeah, I should be fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. Um, I am not a client of PK <laughs> for all the listeners out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my entire failure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it should help people avoid uh, a lot of the pitfalls and mistakes that um, that I made. Mm-hmm. I think it's better if people you know pick those little nuggets out wherever they can mm-hmm. from this uh, podcast. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll be useful for all the people out there. Yeah, for sure. And I always say it's kind of cheesy and we've got like this framed picture on our wall that every uh, failure is a pillar to success and like it kind of sounds corny, but I genuinely believe it. So, I mean, you have a pretty, you've lived, obviously right now you're in Melbourne. Previously, you lived in um, like around the ACT, New South Wales. What got you, like you built that portfolio. Let's go through that as well. But like what got you into property investing in the first place? Well, yeah, just to cut a long story short, I... I joined a consulting IT consulting company and um, the working hours were, how should we put it, pretty long. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was just working, you know, at least nine to nine every day. And at times I'd work on Saturday um, for free. Of course, I get, you know, time in lieu, but I don't get paid for extra for it. Yeah. And I was grinding away doing that. And after two, three years, I got my promotion within the company. It's a global IT consulting company, you know, when when you're fresh from university, you go, oh, you know, I'm so excited to be part of the big four, you know. Suit and tie. Um, Yeah, suit and tie, you know, the corporate dream, because that's what you think. Um, I mean, the people was good, the work was fantastic, but it's just the the system that was built around it, it's basically used to squeeze the life out of you as an individual. Um, I won't mention any names or any companies here, um, but yeah. That's how it's designed and that's how it works across from whether it's technology or business, which I, I assume that you were part of too. And I, and I don't like renting for some reason because I maybe it's, it's my immigrant background. <laughs> we, don't, we don't like debt and we don't like um, renting. You know, it's like, oh, my parents were always like, don't get into debt. It's bad. Debt is bad. <laughs> what is your background, by the way? Like where, where is your heritage from? Uh, I'm back, my background is Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Yeah, Vietnamese. And so your parents, did they migrate here or was it grandparents? Or... Uh, my parents, yeah. My parents migrated here. Uh, my dad migrated here first uh, after the Vietnam War. Okay. And he uh, sponsored myself and my mom over afterwards. Right. Um, yeah. That was during, I, I came over in 1992. So that was a while ago. Um, mm. So I pretty much, I was born over there, spent my first decade there. Then I grew up here. Um, mm. So yeah. I've seen both sides of the fence, (laughs) but coming from that immigrant background, you know, it gave me a bit more of a push, you know, because I've seen how things can be, how how bad things can be. Mm -hmm. Uh, And pretty much I wanted to get out of the grind and that's how I um, started the journey. Basically it's accidental actually, because I rented a place in Melbourne when I first um, moved to Melbourne to work because the rent worked out to be similar to what I would if I had a mortgage on it. So that's why I decided to buy a place here. And I've always been interested in owning property 
because it's always been the you know the immigrant dream to you know, Australian dream sure. in general yeah and that's and I was working so hard six months later so I pretty much I bought a one bedroom property in what's called Ascot Vale it's near the Flemington race course where the Melbourne Cup is held one bedroom apartment uh, for uh, it was 238 but it went up 60k in just about eight months of me doing nothing, you know, I was just what, going to which work. Which year is this? Like what? Uh, 2010. 2010. Okay. Yeah. There was a place in the same complex that was sold for about $60,000 more than mine. Mm, no. And I was like, hang on, hang on. Why am I working so hard? And I'm making just much less than what I would have earned if I've done nothing. I've just signed a few pieces of paper and uh-huh. I didn't know anything about probably investing then. But then that's what, you know, when you're, you take, you start tasting the blood. <laughs> that's when you start to go hang on if it's about making money and surviving there's much better way out there to do that and that's why i got onto the bandwagon and started my own property investing journey i spent every weekend at borders back then there was a bookshop called borders i remember yeah yeah they all closed down now but every yeah. saturday um i would go there and start reading all the self-help property investing books you know, by the old school people like Steve McKnight. Yeah, sure. And um, Margaret Lomas and, you know, all of those books. Um, and yeah, it, after I, re- I decided to, that's what I'm going to do. That's what's going to change my life. But obviously, <laughs> it's much harder than I thought. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, the best thing to do is just to jump in and do it because it doesn't matter how many books you read, um, you know, it helps. It helps build a background. It covers, you know, knowledge gaps and that sort of minimizes risk. But yeah, you got to jump in and do it to get the experience. Then mm-hmm. you, you learn the pitfalls. But mm-hmm. um, yeah. So you're, you're reading all these books and you're um, accumulating a lot of knowledge and probably like back, I mean, 2010, right? Like I started yes. in 2011 and there wasn't that much social media based content. Yes. Um, there were like some seminars, but they're a bit trashy and, and sleazy <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, there wasn't really that much content. So like, so you read these books and then was it the, this first property and presumably like the second and third, you just did all this yourself? Yes, that's correct. Okay. With some help here and there with my, you know, from my parents. Yeah. But um, the first one and the second one I did myself. Um, second one, I, I pretty much released equity from that property. And I bought a three bedroom house on a 500 square meter block in Adelaide uh, in a northern suburb called Salisbury North. Mm-hmm. So it's if you go further, it's Elizabeth, <laughs> the area. Yeah, that, uh, I'm very familiar with Salisbury, <laughs> that whole area. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's where I bought in uh, 2012 was my first uh, investment property. Okay, um, but it's one of those semi-detached houses where you only own half of the house. Yeah, um, but it's separate title, so you know you could potentially knock it down and leave it half. But um, my intention was, just, you know, back then my I did not have my first mistake was not to have a plan. Mm-hmm. I did not set a plan, and that's my first big mistake. So it's to me now I understand that property investing is pretty much a journey, right? Right. So you you you, you 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 jump onto a train and you're trying to get to somewhere. If you don't plan on where you're going, then you know you're pretty much setting yourself out to get lost, and yeah. that's what kind of happened. I I chose the vehicle, uh, the you know the property vehicle because my background I have um so I have an engineering background, um hardware designing and software designing in IT and the other one is um, finance I have a degree in finance as well so I was always interested in technology and also in money right yeah uh, my background is corporate finance so portfolio management and shares uh, building uh, shares a portfolio <clears throat> of shares for clients and stuff like that but I never pursued that path and I just went down the IT path. Mm-hmm. And been stuck with it since. But uh, cut a long story short, um, you know uh, that that's that's what that's what I perceive as um, my journey that I had to go on. And the the, the vehicle I chose was mm-hmm. um, properties instead of shares, right. because there's leverage in there. Because I worked out, you know, if I had ten thousand um, dollars cash saved up, if I invest in shares, ten mm-hmm. percent deposit would give me. A hundred bucks, or a thousand bucks. Sorry, a thousand dollars in return, and you get taxed half. That's gone, and what what are you left with? Five hundred bucks <laughs> after an entire year of risk, and <laughs> ups and downs, and sleepless nights. Whereas the same ten thousand dollars, you can actually use it as a ten ten percent deposit 
back then you can do it on a five percent deposit. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's that's how I built my portfolio because back then the lending rule was much easier right. before APRA stepped in. So, what did um, your parents think? Like, when I don't know if you had a conversation with them around you getting like five percent um, deposit, lo- you know, loans and and you're accumulating all this debt, probably millions of dollars. I don't know because um, you're from that background even like chinese indian all this kind of southeast asian background is like debt is bad whether it's good debt or bad debt everything's bad debt so was it hard for you to become a property investor because your parents were like in in their own like kind of loving way saying no no this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong did you have to fight against the grain or did they eventually succumb and come around to your way of thinking that's right that's how it was Uh, initially there was uh, a bit of pushback and they were skeptical about it they go, oh, you know, that's very risky. Why are you doing this? You know, but then eventually, when I got to my second and third, they were they were on board with it, mm-hmm. and they were actually supportive because they seen that you know it doesn't affect me. I haven't gone bankrupt or gone to jail or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how it was. You know, it's we got to change our mindset. That's that's the other thing that um that you got to do when you want to invest in property. You got to change your mindset completely, right. um, because. You know, debt is not really the enemy if you use it properly. If you can, I mean, like if you're going to use it and borrow some money and splurge it on holidays and shopping sprees and things like that, and, and yeah, that's definitely when debt becomes bad. Yeah. Good old Steve McKnight, he said, he actually said this there's actually two types of debt bad, there's bad debt and worse debt. <laughs> there's okay. actually not good debt and bad debt. Okay. Bad debt and worse debt because at the end of the day, debt is actually debt. Mm-hmm. And our, our, our whole end goal is to get out of it. So we're getting into debt to get out of debt. Yeah. Uh, th- That's the whole purpose. I don't purpose, understand right? that. Like you have, you almost, I don't know if this is too assertive a statement, but to be debt free, you have to get a lot of less than worse debt, you know, or good debt. You have to, you have to leverage. But I, I'm curious. Um, I mean, I didn't read all these books when I started, like Margaret Lomas and Steve McKnight, because even back then I kind of figured that when they had written them, it the strategy worked. But even 2011, like when I started, you know, I was like, this is a bit dated, but I think all credit where credit is due and those are terrific books by um, all accounts and people get a lot of value out of them. You didn't, you made this comment before that you didn't have a plan, like you you didn't, but presumably all of these books were saying, you know, have a strategy, have a long-term plan, have a short-term plan, have a game map, have a blueprint of why you're doing it, what you're doing. Like I'm, I'm asking this question because a lot of people get kind of, they see money, you know, that it's like they put on these glasses and they're like, oh my God, property market going up, cha-ching, I just want to get onto the first property and then figure out education or whatever later. It's like FOMO. And it's really hard to to tell them to kind of just take a step back and create a plan because if you have a strategy that you can go far, much far forward or more forward. Um, but what was your rationale for like, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot and I don't mean to be mean, no, no. but like, why didn't you have a plan? <laughs> well, basically I was just too busy, you know, just working the way that I was working. I, I was, when it, by the time I go home, you know, my wife would be asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Food would be cold on the table, you know, I hardly get to see her and get right. to spend time with her yeah, to that extent. And uh, the books that I've read, they have more, I guess, more of a general generic, oh, you know, you got to set yourself out to buy as many properties as you can right. and hold it for as long as you can. That was the general rule. And they were saying um, things like um, property cycle was, was about 10 years. Uh-huh. And then other books were saying, you know, it's more, it's 12 to 15 years. But now um, after, after finding out about what's called the 18 and a half year property cycle, and mapping it back, I thought, wow, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I mean, that's to me, that's important for exiting. That's more important for exiting. Whereas, I've, I've, from what I've seen from your course, your course, or what you presented on your videos so far, um, is your course may provide good information on entering. Yeah. So, if I guess if we if I join your course, um, uh, presumably I would be able to learn to pick out what to buy at any point of, in time throughout um, the property cycle because it doesn't quite matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but for exiting, and this is the other mistake that I made, I had no clue when property is going down or up. <laughs> I just sold, you know. Had mm-hmm. I known, uh, I would have, you know, jiggled things around a bit, sell off the part that's really 
performing bad, kept it. Had I done that, I would have made uh, a significant amount of profit. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, yeah. let's go through your properties. So you have two. Um, you've got one in that apartment in Melbourne and the one in North Salisbury in Adelaide. What was your third purchase? Um, so the third, so when I moved to um, Canberra um, to, to work, I could not, I, did, I wanted to buy something instead of rent, you know, because mm-hmm. that's the mentality I had back then because no, I think I still carry that mentality. Um, so I want to buy a, a, something that's affordable, you know, within commuting distance to uh, work in Canberra. And I bought a place in a suburb on the border of Canberra. It's called Queenbian. So it falls into New South Wales, um, mm-hmm. but it's not part of ACT, but it's commutable within 20, 20, 25 minutes to Canberra. So, yeah, it's a suburb called Queen Bin. I bought a two-bedroom unit there. Mm-hmm. And um, I, it, it was pretty grummy, you know. Uh, so I, I decided to renovate it myself. So I, I got into renovation. I learned to things. And this is the modern mistake. <laughs> so I tried to do everything myself. Right. <laughs> and that's one of the worst things you can do as a property investor. You know, it's like if you're going to get sick, you don't spend six years to do a medical degree just to cure your own sickness, <laughs> right? just to save that $80 doctor fee. <laughs> right? You leverage of the skills of others. That's my right. other mistake. Sure. So I've spent time learning about painting. I paid money to go and do a tiling course. And I tiling did tiling course. It's very yeah. specific. <laughs> and I did tiling myself. I did painting myself. But obviously other stuff... Um, like plumbing and electrical, mm-hmm. um, I, I could not risk it because, you know, insurances and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've also I've read in some of the books that, you know, when you renovate, um, do not attempt these because it can end up pretty bad. So, yeah, I renovated it. I spent about 10000 renovating it and um, I came out 60000 ahead on that one as well. Well, 50, 55, I think. <clears throat> that was back in 2013. Yeah. And, um, I used that money to buy a, a three-bedroom townhouse in Canberra. So I, uh, I went to Canberra in a northern suburb called Bonner. Uh, it's part of the Gangalan area in, in Canberra because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I want to actually be a part of Canberra again, you know, so it's closer to commute right. and it's a better, better quality housing because it's in a new suburb, so the house was quite new. Right. Um, so, yeah, I bought a three-bedroom house there. That's, uh, that's my fourth property. Yeah. So you have two houses now and two units or, or kind Correct. of... Correct, yeah. two units. Well, actually, I <clears throat> I sold the um, Queen Bean one. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't want to carry that debt. Um, that was my other mistake <laughs> <laughs> when I could have just released it and kept it. So you can see mistakes throughout the whole journey. Um, yeah, so I've kept the Sourcebury one and I've kept the Melbourne apartment uh-huh. and I've serviced... <laughs> The new house in Canberra. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my fourth property. Right. And at which point, um, the year after that, actually, the house in Sorcery. So the house in Sorcery was a half house. It was attached to another house on the other side. Yeah. Yep. So in 2016, that house came up for sale. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, hang on, maybe I should buy that one as well. So I bought that for 180k <laughs> at that point in time. <laughs> yeah. With the with the mindset, oh, oh you know. I'm just going to develop it. You know, I'm going to become this gung-ho developer. <laughs> no plan. This is no. classic. It's like a classic move. You know, when property investors get like a couple or few properties under the belt, the next thing is like, I'm going to develop my way to the moon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go. No plan. I had no plan. I did not know how, what the, what's going to, going to be involved, what the costs are, what the risk mm-hmm. are. <laughs> You know, later on, I, I talked to my broker and he's like, oh, mate, you, you know, the LVR on that is very, very low. You know, your developments, you need about 50% <laughs> cash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I worked out afterwards when I actually did the numbers. Um, this is way after I bought it. <laughs> it's worked out to be about one and a half to two mil to develop the site with three units, three townhouses. And it was, oh, my God, because oh, you have to God. actually know your... You have to do research. You have to know what type of property are in demand. You can't just randomly develop a block of units right in a suburb where there's just houses all around. That's People not, are not yeah. going to like that. <laughs> yeah. so the best thing you can do is a, the townhouse, like you know, a two-story house with at least some land on it. Uh-huh. That's the market there at that point yeah. in time. 
So these are the things I did not do. So no game plan, no nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, was... and this is very interesting because, you know, on the face of it, someone can be like, oh, you're super successful, right? Because you've got six properties or they can be like, PK, you're super successful because you've got like 12 properties. But it's like, what's actually the quality and the, and the purpose of those properties and what are they doing for you? It's, it's Otherwise, it's a vanity metric. I, I want to ask as well, like, were you using some sort of method, whether it's a simple method or complicated method to figure out which suburbs to buy like now you'd bought two in the Salisbury area in Adelaide were you like really confident about Salisbury or what, what was the rationale <laughs> that's the other mistake PK <laughs> okay. I bought it in my backyard because I grew up in Adelaide um so that's right. my hometown so right my, my parents are pushing for me to get something you know get something close to home you know because you know in case you, you move back there you need to move back there mm -hmm. so that's the mentality I had I was always I was always buying wherever I was. So, <laughs> so when I moved to Melbourne, I bought where I was in my home, in my own backyard instead of, you know, following the growth, right. following the data. So um, did you consider interstate investing or was it I did, like, yeah. but you never like, you never actually executed upon that because you're like, well, I've just moved to this new city. I don't have any property here. I'm just might as well get one in the bag in here as well. Like you never considered like, oh, not that it was a good time to buy in Brisbane, but while you were in Adelaide, what about some suburbs in Brisbane or some suburbs in Sydney or whatever? No, I did not. I did not. I, I actually, the only reason why I was in Melbourne, I was buying in Adelaide was because I actually lived in Adelaide. So I, I was actually familiar with it. Yeah. That's the only reason why I had the confidence to buy interstate. Yeah, like, um, other than that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have. Uh, that that's my other mistake. So I did not even consider buying in Queensland or Perth or Tasmania, or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. So although my properties were spread between South Australia, Victoria, and New South Wales, mm -hmm. it was only because I've actually lived there <laughs> and been. <Yeah>. There. So. <laughs> That's and my it, other mistake. Yeah, <laughs> I'm learning a lot actually, and I hope I hope everyone's learning a lot as well. I mean, it's, it's pretty rare that you get someone kind of very openly and honestly share mostly their mistakes. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it's very valuable for the rest of us. And this, so you got. I mean, I know you sold one in the middle, but that's five. Did you buy one more property? Um, yeah. No, yes. Before you sold them all. So, um, after that, I decided to um, move to Melbourne because we wanted to actually, because um, we actually going back and forth, you know, visited Melbourne and we liked the city. We liked the lifestyle and we wanted, we wanted to achieve that lifestyle. So yeah, I went to Melbourne and bought a block of land in the Tarnit, Truganine area, which, <laughs> which is where I am now as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because we wanted to build our dream home. There's there's the other mistake. <laughs> Air quotation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there's no such thing as a dream home as as I've found out. Right. What do you mean by that? There's no such thing as dream home. So there's there's homes that you would buy that you would like to live in uh -huh. for a period of time, be it five or ten years. Uh -huh. But that would change and then you'd get yeah. another one. So that dream home never really exists. It's actually what's right for you at that point in time. Well, you're just, you're spitting wisdom, my friend, that I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I know it's like very romantic in a way to think, oh, there's this amazing home and, well, you know, we're going to grow old here and our, our kids are going to grow up here and that job is always going to be there and, you know, they're going to have those two amazing cars in the garage. But I think the statistics as well in Australia show that the average tenure um you know somewhere who someone who lives in a home is like 5 to 7 years and it's coming down like as the decades pass that's coming down so we're we're very restless people um so i i do agree with that and that's a really good point yeah. thanks pk yeah that that's how it is unfortunately um it's relative but right? everything's relative yeah it's it's it all depends right so um, you're living in that home that that you bought back then right now Yes, I built it and I've moved moved in in 2019, and that's my my uh my sixth property. Sixth property. Yeah, and um we, but to to do actually, after I bought the block of land before finishing the build of this house, we bought a unit in Queenbean again. Okay. So I bought that with my friend because, so it's it's kind of half. So I'm not sure right. if you'd count that as part six and of... a half slash seven properties. Yeah. yeah. So that's the property we bought there in Queen Bean, the two bedroom unit. And we tried to do a flip on it. Um, but it, we ended up holding it for much longer, you know, at least for 12 months just to get that 50% uh, capital gains tax discount. Yeah. So if, uh, if, if 
for those people who aren't uh, aren't aware of the the, the discount, Mm -hmm. the ruling is that if you hold your property for at least 12 months and you make a capital gains on it, a profit on it, half of that profit goes into your pocket. Then the other half gets taxed, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, based on the income. Yeah. That's, that's, That's why I tend to hold everything for at least 12 months. Um, you know, I, I got a few things right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And <laughs> but, what was uh, that process like buying with a friend? Like, did you get up? <clears throat> did you get joint venture agreements set up, or did you have buy in a unit trust where it's very um, discreet way of kind of managing the ownership, or did you just you were you just like really good friends and didn't care about all the legalities? Yeah, we uh, we were really good friends and we didn't care about that, and we bought it <laughs> uh, under our own names. Uh, I think it's joint tenants. Or tenants in common, not joint tenants, 50 mm-hmm. 50 split. You can put the split amount in the in the contract, yeah. And yeah, um, so we did that and we sold that before the boom <laughs> uh... <laughs> in 2018, 20, 2019. <laughs> yeah, that's the other mistake not knowing the cycle, not knowing when to sell. Like I said, the cycle is very useful when you when you exit. Uh... When you so people argue, um, you know, it's been an age old long debate. Uh, what's what's more important, time in the market or timing the market? Mm-hmm. From my experience of making so many mistakes, both are important. Mm-hmm. Timing the market is important when you're entering or exiting because you don't want to be buying when it's at, at the peak and you don't want to be exiting while it's at the bottom. Yeah, but Timing the market is very important when you're getting in and getting out. But once you get in, time in the market is important yeah. because you have to be there for at least one cycle for it to grow. Um, to benefit from that growth. No, well said. I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I think there's some people who say timing the market's not important, and most of the time they're people trying to sell you something like properties, and so they're like, oh, "It's always a good time to buy off me, right?" Uh, and then there's some people who say timing the market is more important than time in the market. But I, I've yet to really <clears throat> meet someone who can reliably and predictably time the market perfectly as well and like yeah everyone knows property is a long-term game you're not going to exit your nine to five in one year five years maybe not even 10 years for most people um and so like what you know so you're you're obviously you know you're of the school of thought that timing the market is also important is that why you sold except for the way you're living in in melbourne is that why you sold these properties because you thought oh hey the cycle is going to go down for a lot of these areas uh, no, a lot of it is was because um, this is the other thing that I didn't plan for. <laughs> Life gets in the way. Um, so um, I had more and more kids. So I've got two <laughs> yeah. kids now. And right. When you kids- say more and more, it sounds like you had like dozens of two kids. <laughs> no, no. Two kids. <laughs> yeah. I started with zero kids. Uh, yeah. then we, we, we ended up with two kids. Sure, and sure, sure. that eats away our serviceability. And, and when we moved, my wife had to um, quit a job, you know. Uh, she sacrificed that to, for us to get the better lifestyle. So, you know, and I really appreciate her for that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And our serviceability just went through the the bottom and we ended up having to sell, sell off our portfolio, fire sale. Um, oh, obviously not at a loss, you know, we break even on the, the source free ones. Yeah. And um, we've made some profits from the other ones that's seen good growth. Um, especially the one in in uh, in Canberra in the suburb called Bonner, that one nearly doubled in value <laughs> in 2022 <laughs> from the time I sold it in 2017. Oh, no, <laughs> it's, it's, I should have kept it for another year or two. <laughs> yeah, Canberra's been so good even before COVID. Like I remember we were buying in places like uh, Dunlop, you know, and like the um, northwestern area, and these are like very lower socioeconomic areas. You could buy something around those types of areas for like 400. Um, and like in 2017, 18, and even before COVID, they'd gone up to like 600, 700. So it was, it was like, yeah, I feel if you sold it in 2018, that was like the worst timing <laughs> imaginable. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, but um, my biggest, biggest mistake though, was I was just scraping through when I expanded my portfolio. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I had no game plan. My game plan was to buy as many as you can and hold it for as long as you can. Yeah, now, I think I did right on the buying as many as you can bit. Yeah, but I stuffed up on the holding for as long as you can bit. The reason being was because I stretched everything thin. So there's some growth in it. I would release that equity, and would I'd buy the next one with all of it. Right. Instead of so now 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 I have a strategy. I whenever I release my equity, 
I would keep a portion of it as a buffer because right. um, it's not a question of when things, oh, it's not a question of if things will go wrong, but it's a question of right. when they will go wrong. Yeah. yeah. And, and at one, I remember one point in time when I was living in uh, Canberra, um, I received a phone call from my property manager in Adelaide with the two, the two attached, semi detached houses in Adelaide and Salisbury. It cost that one phone call cost me nine thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the air cons in the um the other house it uh-huh. broke down. And uh-huh. you're looking at three grand to replace it. There is one one of those big ones. <laughs> so with the tenancy rule, if there is anything installed, you are liable to replace it or fix it for the tenants. That's how it is. Great. That's why I avoid buying things with swimming pools and yeah. you know. That's scary. <laughs> yeah. The cost can go through the roof. You need a bigger buffer for those kind of properties. Yeah. I mean, it's all well and good if you can live in it. Like I said, like um, PPII, you know, your principal place of residence, it doesn't matter what you buy and when you buy it. As yeah. long as you enjoy it and, you know, that's what you want, then yeah. Right. So, so these properties, like, they weren't necessarily negatively geared. In other words, the expenses weren't necessarily higher than the income. But the fact that every, and just so everyone understands, when they rose in value and then you refinance them to take equity out, obviously that's not free money. Like that's also a loan. Equity is also a loan. And so that meant that even though capital growth had occurred, you had to pay additional interest payments. And then when your um, your good wife, she stopped working, when the kids came around, then your household budget couldn't afford that now negatively geared portfolio. Is that is that what you're saying? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for summarizing that. No, no. I just want everyone to really connect with that point because like you've said as well, a few times, long-term strategy is important. And if you know, or you know that you're going to have kids at some point, you don't know exactly what year or whatever, you need to like cash flow these things out and then reverse engineer it and say, okay, well, if my wife or husband or whatever will reduce the hours or start working, then can we still hold these properties? And even though those positive cash, they might be positive cash flow now, if you're planning on refinancing to take more equity to build that portfolio, that may mean that that positive cash flow goes slightly negative, and, and, you know, for a period of time at least. So presumably you didn't have like some sort of Excel, I mean, you're probably like a, a whiz at, at, at numbers and data and, and all this sort of thing by the sounds of it, but you didn't really have like a cash flow statement for your household finances or anything like that. <laughs> no, no, no. All I had was I built like a small spreadsheet with um, all of the costings of purchasing the properties. Yeah. Um, I would put the rent against it and then I just formula it out. And then that would tell me, you know, what kind of cash flow it is then and there. Mm-hmm. But obviously, you know, that needs a bit of rework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And oh. um yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So you sold everything and then you're left with obviously your principal place of residence and you're breathing a big sigh of relief. You're like, yeah, I I'm like now not underwater anymore. I can afford everything. And then like as of recently, right, 2021, you were saying to me before we hit record, then you're of the mindset that now I'm going to ramp back up again. Yes. Um, so I wanted, I knew the property is the only way that I, well, not the only way, but, you know, one of the only ways that you can get out of uh, the rat race. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to be part of it again. So I started my journey again. And again, I made a mistake. <laughs> I employed a buyer's agent. <laughs> Because, you know, um, during the lockdown, you see all these ads and stuff like that about buyer's agency. They can get you the magical suburb. But really, um, I found it to be a huge mistake because pretty much I paid them big money just to do their work for them. For something that I could have gone on to realestate.com.au or watch your video <laughs> and then gone on to realestate.com.au and did it free all myself. Free video, right? <laughs> yeah, free video. So thank you for that, PK. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge and thoughts uh, and your nuggets of gold. Um, yeah, that's why I found it interesting. And I thought I would share my thoughts with you, even though I'm not a client of yours. Mm-hmm. So just for all your listeners out there, I am not paid by PK to share the story. <laughs> <laughs> Although I intend to be, I intend to be, because um, I think it's uh, PK is the only one who actually, from my personal perspective, uh, is the only person who is actually willing to share his skills this particular set of skills using data um and and i think you know being a a scientist and engineer myself i I think data uh, doesn't lie Mm. data although you know it's not 
it can't be 100% precise, but it's very, very close to what the truth is. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll probably um, join in your course later on, maybe. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, um, when you, you're like you said before, when you're in lockdown and you're at home and there's nothing to do and you're scrolling your social feeds, there's so much. Ad- I mean, I don't do any ads; like, I just post organically. I don't run any paid ads, but you do see a lot of paid ads as, yes. as soon as you even talk to your wife or husband, right, about like property. Then somehow the whole social ecosystem knows that you're into property and that spits out true. ads. And all, I mean, there are some, obviously, some very select. Um, good buyers agents, but most of them sort of espouse this idea of we know more than you. Therefore, you need us to be able to get a good outcome. We're private av- advisory. We're experts. We're much better. We have unique expertise, the data that you could never find, you know, properties that you could never find. So is that kind of what led you down that alley? Yes, I fell for that. I totally fell for that. Um, I thought they had the, the magic crystal ball and they, they would know something that I don't know. And I, yeah, I paid big money and Fortunate for them uh, was the team, uh, the the research team that I had within their um, organization um, was actually pretty good. I don't know how they did it. I don't know their methodology. They won't share that, obviously. Um, but they picked out uh, a suburb in Perth, in the Rockingham area, um, just before the boom in 20, 2021. Yeah. Um, the bias agent. So what I, from what I can see, is they employ bias agents from outside into their um, er- their area and they would filter out properties that this these buyers agents would present to them based on their research team and the data that re- their research team have or whatever methodology that they may have. Mm-hmm. And I think because of that, that saved them. Um, but the buyers agent that was assigned to me for my purchase was absolutely terrible. It would take him a whole day to respond to my one message. If I send him one email or one message, it would take him the end of the day, all the way to like 6 or 7 p.m. to respond to me. And when you're buying in a um, hot market, uh, that's that's a pretty bad sign. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I've made complaints and stuff, and, you know, it's all went to deaf ears. Yeah. I mean, it's, if, it's kind of a buyer's agent's role to be there for the client. You know, they should take a select few clients that they can um, actively manage and be on the phone with because they need to be the middleman between the um, the real estate agent and you. Otherwise, you might as well just skip them and talk to the real estate agent yourself, right? And my, my, that actually might be more efficient if you think about it. <laughs> exactly. I, I was so willing, to, I was so tempted to do that, um, you know, but I didn't want to um, jump the gun, but um, I stuck it out. But in the end, I, I, had, I just had enough. So my thought flipped and then I just, call the um the agent and i ended up doing most of the work for the buyer's agent myself <laughs> yeah mm. and, and i secured the property and all the negotiation was it's mostly done by me mm. although um, in in written form um i still had to go through him although after i you know had a chat to the agent through the phone but yeah it was just a very bad experience through and through i wouldn't recommend it um yeah yeah. And obviously we won't mention who, who the spies agent is, but generally the bigger ones are more um, more liable to have these experiences because the person that you see on, whether it's hearing on them on the podcast or on YouTube or wherever, it's not the boss. It's not the CEO that you're dealing with, right? They have their perhaps inexperienced people that they've recently hired and and those are the buyers agents that you're actually dealing with. And it's not like the CEO who spends all their time on marketing is going to be vetting every single suburb, every single property, every single communication. So it's basically is the you're dealing with the lowest common denominator of that company. And if if that person is the lowest person is more talented, more skillful, more competent, and has really good character that you want, then that's fine. But generally speaking, they don't. And and I think this is just a, it's not their fault. This is just a product of big companies. When you go with a smaller buyer's agent, maybe they only take two or three clients a, a month and, you know, it's kind of a single operator or maybe have one or two team members. I, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not pro buyer's agent, generally speaking, but if you do want to use one, that those are generally the better operators, if you know what I mean. Would, would that make sense to you as well? That would make sense. That would make sense. Yeah. 
the smaller the team, the more customized the service, I guess. And yeah. The more time they'd have to spend with you. Right. But right. yeah, it was pretty much a case of here's a property, buy it. That's it. And I was like, why? Why is this property good? Can you can you tell me? It's like pros and cons. <laughs> pros and cons. One slide. That's it. Oh, uh-huh, here, you know, these projects, these. That's it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not much. It's like at least to present me with two or three. You know, mm-hmm. within the state. No, it's just one. Here's one. Bye. Especially if like, because you and me, we're from like corporate backgrounds, and in corporate Australia, for better or worse, it's like death by PowerPoint, or there's death by analysis, or death by meetings. And so you're accustomed to like just absorbing a lot of information <laughs> with before making a decision. But if you're sent like one slide, maybe it's like poorly formatted, which is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, but you know, it's like, God, like I have to make a five hundred thousand dollar decision based on five bullet points on the single slide. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. I think that's it. I think you hit the nail on the head there because we're from that, you know, corporate background. We like deep analysis. We like more details. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah it didn't go well for me but um the outcome was good because yeah that has seen it's significant growth since 2021 yeah so yeah that that saved them um but i wouldn't yeah. use them again for the life of me no that was a yeah. horrible experience very stressful you know just you're sitting there the whole time waiting for a phone call you call them back they hang up on you call them back they hang up on you they wouldn't respond it's like come on this is not what i paid for you know yeah <laughs> It's uh, anyways, uh, at least the outcome was good, right? So, I mean, whether you go through a buyer's agent or not, it was a good time to buy a property in, in that Rockingham area generally, of course, right street, right property um, in 2021. And even on like forums like Property Chat, like oh, you've been a property investor for a long time. I'm, I'm sure you, you know, Property Chat and places like this. People were talking about Rockingham back then. You could have just gone by that and did it yourself. But I think action beats inaction. So even though you had a terrible experience with that buyer's agency, you know, you're probably thinking, oh, look, I'm actually glad I bought that property as opposed to didn't buy that property. So I think that's also a good t- uh, takeaway for for those of you guys who are watching or listening, like action beats inaction. Like obviously, you know, choose the right buyer's agency or you don't actually actually choose any, um, but at least do something. And and so then you've kind of not bought anything since then, but you're sort of biding your time, getting your finances in order to to start going. Are you Are you planning on going hard now or... You know what's what's your plans now? No, I'm actually planning to go uh, slow but steady. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's good. Before. That's good. You learned the <laughs> lesson. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sitting around waiting for my um, finances to consolidate. You know, probably get the missus um, back into the workforce and mm-hmm. improve our cash flow and, and our serviceability. Perhaps then I'll I'll give you a buzz and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, Join the gang. <laughs> honestly speaking, I, I said this at the event that I did uh, last week in Sydney, where it was like more than 1100 people that came, but I genuinely get as much of a buzz when someone DMs me and they're like, PK, so sorry, I never did your course, but here's the property I bought and I've just refinanced it and I've made X money. And like, I'm very grateful for all your content and all that sort of thing. I get as much of a buzz from that than an email that I get from a client who's obviously paid $6,000 and they're sharing a result. It's the result that matters. It's not me lining my pockets in the middle that matters so much. Obviously I would say that, but I genuinely mean it. So um, I guess just to finish off, um, Tin as well, What's like your, I don't know, what's your top three pieces of advice that we haven't run through um, yet Mm. that you can give to, let's even say experienced property, new or experienced property investors, people who are maybe sitting here in, what is it, end of August um, 2023 and thinking, hey, look, uh, I've just missed a huge property boom, maybe in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth. I know it's booming right now, but you know, everyone's saying it's a mining town, even though I know prices have already dropped 50%. It's no longer a mining boom, but everyone still thinks it's a mining town. I don't know where to invest. Like, I honestly don't know um, how I can emulate these results that people were fortunate to get in the last 10 years because they experienced a couple of booms. Like, who knows if there's more booms coming? What would you like say to people like that who are perhaps even new to the country and are like, is it the right time to buy? Is it not? What what kind of words of wisdom can you share? Um, so I guess the three, three advice I'd give is, first of all, don't try to do things yourself that you don't, do not know. If you know, then do it. If you don't, don't try to do it yourself. Follow an expert. 
uh, find a mentor. So whether it be, you know, find someone experience or join your group, because that's where the experts, they can share their wisdom with you because they've been there. They've done it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's how, that's the safest way to go. That's the first advice I'd give. The second advice I'd give is people tend to, well, especially with new investors, they would think that property investment is about buying properties, but that's not at all. That's not the case at all. Buying the property is just one part of the whole thing. So the second advice is to have a game plan. Property investing is about risk management and um, risk mitigation. That's, sorry, asset control, asset management, and risk mitigation. Got it. Those are the two things that property uh, investing is about. That's that true of the whole true anywhere. That's Be just life, right? That's just yeah. life, yeah. yeah. So you can have a portfolio of businesses. I know a lot of you know successful people, they, they hold a portfolio of different businesses. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be the uh, property vehicle. It can be shares. It can be anything, you know? So it's about asset management and it's about risk management. Whether then when you're going into the into the market, when you're buying in or when you're going out, you're exiting the market. Mm-hmm. You've got to manage that risk, right? So you, you, you manage your property managers, you manage or your... your um, building and pest controllers. You manage your um, property bro- managers, property your, your brokers, brokers, yes. etc. Yeah. Etc. So it's all about risk management, right? That's what it is. Sometimes people get too involved, be it in experienced investors, and they forget about these things. And mm-hmm. that's the the second point I uh, I point out. And I guess lastly, the third point is get the balance right i guess um it's because property investing is very individualized there's mm-hmm. no right universal formula that will work for everyone everyone's different everyone's got different risk appetites they have different way of thinking so you know for me um although i have made the mistake of buying my um ppor instead of rent vesting but i think i'll probably still do it again you know just to cater for a place for my family to live in. It's yeah. about balance, you know? I think, uh, enjoy the journey. That's the last. I love that. Yeah. So I, I love think... that. I love that. Because yeah. if you spend your whole life living like a beggar on baked beans and toast, just to build a portfolio, time is the most important thing in the whole wide world. Steve McKnight told me, um, how many 10 years do you have, Tim? How many 10 years do you have? So I spent the past 10 years ruining my first portfolio. So now <laughs> <laughs> I realized 10 years, there's not many left, you know? So mm. you got to enjoy life. You got to enjoy life. Yeah. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the investing journey, be it good or bad, because either way, it will make you a better investor. Mm-hmm. So true. Oh, you're a very, very wise man, um, Tin. Yeah, some, someone also said to me, and it's like a different way of saying the same thing, like you only have maybe 60, 70, maybe 75, 80 summers in your life you know how many summers have you already had and i'm like oh damn it i'm probably over halfway 33 summers down like how many are left and if you think about it that way then you start to see that property investing is not the be and end all of your life but it's kind of one category or one bucket of your life but that one bucket can have a disproportionate impact on all the other buckets or all the other categories of your life. So keep a healthy balance, but don't ignore it because all the other aspects of your life, like, you know, how much enjoyment you can have by traveling around with your fam- family, how much time you get back to spend with your family, you know, you, how much you can disregard financial stress, all of that stuff can be solved by that one bucket or one category, um, but it can't make you happy. <laughs> you know, I can I cannot say that I am any happier than before I was a property investor, financially happier, but not overall. You know, happiness comes from different places, but um, that that's really wise words said said by you. So, so thank you so much. And um, before we end it, did you want to say anything else? Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you, PK, for your time. And um, you know, I'll probably on behalf of every. Uh, every listener that you've got out there on your YouTube channel and on your Facebook group, we uh, we thank you for sharing your your wisdom with us. Oh, you're too and, kind. Um, yeah, and very um, you're very polite about the whole thing, <laughs> even though in situations where you could have yeah <laughs> gone the other way, but you've always polite even with people who you disagree with. And but most of all, you know, you've shared a lot of your knowledge, which I find quite useful. I think one of your videos is also one of the reasons why I chose to to go down to Perth and um, purchase it. Yeah. 
nice. with the buys agent. Yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you, PK. No, thank you. And um, yeah, thank you for being a very um, active and helpful member and also a humorous member of the of the Facebook group. Um, Tin, I really appreciate it, guys. I will share this, of course, on all platforms, but also in, in my Facebook community, Australian Property Investment um, Mastery. Australian Property Mastery with Pika, I should know that. And I'll tag Tin Nguyen um, in that. And he's a super nice guy, like I said. And he said as well, he's not a client of the course, so you can't really, don't DM him to be like, is the course worth it? Because he hasn't done it. Um, but you can DM him or comment in the video um, if you want some advice, because he's, he's kind of been there and done that. And to some extent, I would say is, is almost as knowledgeable as me um, or as knowledgeable as me because he's, he's an experienced property investor. So kudos and credit where, where credit is due. And I appreciate your time. And, and I'm sure everyone will um, will get a lot of benefit and be gra grateful to you um, for sharing what you've shared. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, BK. Right. Thank you, everyone, for, for watching or listening. And I always say, you know, that the most important real estate is at six inches between your two ears. I'm trying to build you and sort of bring you more and more authentic and, and raw um, content, you know, not from people who have an agenda or trying to sell you something, but just knowledge for knowledge sake. I hope you guys appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button. and I'll see you next time. See you later.